No, it's not a reference. No, it's not a reference. That is Leon Trotsky over there with an Attila Sobaka t shirt. From the wonderful Hobo Jones and the Junkyard Dogs. We're a very, very good band. All right, and my bits yesterday because you were more or less at the same time as me. But uh, anyway, we'll have a chat later on. But this is the poem I'm going to do now. This, um, we pu I published it in a booklet. It's called The Long Goodbye. It's very long, it's true. Some of it, a lot of it is very sad. It's got a lot of laughs in too. We pu published it in a booklet, you know, the Alzheimer's Society. We've already raised just about probably one and a half grand. Um, and all the money, if you buy a copy of this, all the money goes to the Alzheimer's Society. I wrote it a few months before my mum died as her memory was getting worse. I wanted her to remember who she was and about the interesting life she had. And I wanted to try and help myself uh, deal with a, a situation which was absolutely heartbreaking. And um, this is called The Long Goodbye. This is a poem for you, Mum. It's about your long, eventful life, the you that you were, and the you that you are now, the different you, the you with Alzheimer's. It's to help you remember. And yes, I knew when I was writing this that it was to help me too. So this is a poem for us, Mum. You say, it's like wading through treacle. When I get through the treacle, there's a mist, which makes me wonder why I bothered with the treacle. But there are places we could go in the hours we spend together where there is no treacle, no mist, where everything is clear. Back to Gravesend, to the council house, to the stern Victorian printer father and the spirited, intelligent little girl who went to Reading for the holidays to stay with your maiden aunt, a teacher, and discovered a new magical world, the piano. This child is musical, Ethel. She must be taught. Aunt Evelyn paid for your lessons and your talent blossomed church organist at 16, and not just in music, the scholarship to the county grammar school, matriculation, and then came the war. You say, it's as though bits of my mind are still awake, and bits have gone to sleep, or start imagining things. You were sent to Bletchley Park, you mostly can't remember what happened yesterday, but you can still describe every corridor at Bletchley, the walks to the town, and of course, the hours at the piano in the music room typing through the night on one of the Enigma decoding machines. Smoking to stay awake, you've always hated smoking. And the bustle and uproar when the nonsense you were typing suddenly turned to germ and the boffins gathered round you, urging you on. Faster, faster. Your three friends, Jean, Margaret, Wynne. Still friends, nearly 70 years later. When the mist is all around, I say, tell me about Bletchley Park. In an instant, I have my mum back. You say, I am learning the difference between understanding and memory. I can still speak, still form sentences, talk to people, read The Guardian and enjoy it. Though I don't remember what I've read or what I've said, in one ear, out the other. But if my memory is gone, how is it that I remember how to understand? After Bletchley, London, Notting Hill, working at Bateman's Opticians in Kensington and High Street, singing with the Royal Choral Society and a Malcolm Sargent, premiering the works of Elgar. The music appreciation class where you met my father, 25 years your senior, living in a hostel on the run from a brutal marriage. He brought the sunshine back into his life and when the divorce made the national press as a legal precedent, you didn't care, you were one. Visiting the Isle of Harris, honeymoon in Switzerland, my father's love poems to you. Yes, that's where I got this from. You tell me over and over again, the words from him, the music from you. Okay, not exactly in the way you'd have expected. Rude words, loud music, but you're used to that now. You've had more than 30 years of it, after all. You say, I know the meaning of the phrase, a fate worse than death. Come on, Mum, you're at home in your warm, comfortable house in Southwick. We live just around the corner. I'm here, my wife Rabina's here, family and friends are here. You could be in Baghdad or Kabul, family killed, cowering in a ruined cellar, not knowing who or where you were. It's not that bad. You say, you're right, John. I mustn't be so silly. Together we smile and sing, always look on the bright side of life. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. I go and make a cup of tea. I bring it to you. You say, I know the meaning of the phrase, a fate worse than death. Of course, I'm used to the repetition but I'll never get used to that. Now we're moving into the 50s, and here's the treacle. You can't remember the year I was born. How can I forget that? Then, with great authority, 1947. Hang on, Mum. 
You weren't married till 53, and though I'm a bit of an old git these days, I'm not that much of an old git. It was 57. Tears fill your eyes. How can I forget that? I remember you as a little boy, always questioning, always loud. No, mummy. Why, mummy? Too right. You say, I've spent my life doing, and now I'm just being. The move to Southwick when I was three. The worms, then the fish, lizards, slow worms, newts, terrapins. Going to football every week with my father, and the one time I heard you argue. Do you remember why it was? That's right. He left his Brighton season to get in his trouser pocket. You put the trousers in the washing machine. We both laughed. You say, memory is such a wonderful thing, but you don't appreciate that until it's disappearing. My brain feels like a sponge with great big holes in it. I tell you how clever you are to use that analogy, because if you look at a photograph of the brain of a person with Alzheimer's, that's exactly what it looks like, a sponge with great big holes in it. Sometimes you say your brain feels like soup, or suet pudding, or sausages, but mostly it's a sponge, a thirsty sponge, full of life, which soaked up everything it possibly could for more than 80 years, and is now gently leaking it away. You say, I love you, my son. You are my rock. I say, I love you too, mum. I'm your punk rock. <laughs> then the difficult years. My father's death when I was 10. Yes, it was 1968, mum. And that feels like a lifetime. It's half of one. My battles with school and a new stepfather. And so away to university. To the world of punk rock. To a band and a squat in Brussels. A flat in Harlow Town with my friend Steve. And in 1980, to a life as a teller of the stockbroker. A life you tried hard to understand and discussed with me late into the night on my visits home. A life you always encouraged and were proud of, and on a few memorable occasions came to share, as we will see. Of course, you had your own life, very different from mine. Organist in three churches, teaching the piano, singing with the Brighton Festival Chorus, playing with Southwick Operatic Society, president of Southwick WI. Remember the gig I did for your WI? You must ask your son to come and read for us, Muriel. You were very worried. I'm not surprised. I chose my material carefully. I got an encore. And in 1981, you won your first big battle, breast cancer. You say, Alzheimer's is such a cruel disease. You can have your breast removed, but not your head. That's a shame. The surgeon prodded your breast and said, that'll have to come off. His exact words. So angered and devastated were you by his unbelievable insensitivity that after your mastectomy and your recovery by New Zealand where you went to see your brother, this is going to kill me, I'm going to see Mick in New Zealand first. You started a local counselling service for people with cancer, especially women with breast cancer, especially women with breast cancer dealing with insensitive male bastards. You knew. You helped so many people. And I was so proud of you. You say, time is all out of joint. Things that happened yesterday seem a long time ago. The things that happened a long time ago seem like yesterday. That is frightening. Now we're in the 90s and we're knee deep in treacle. Remember Canada Mum? Not really. I'll remind you. 1991. You said, I'll come with you. My old Bletchley friend Wynne lives in Toronto. And you did. I was touring. 11 cities east to west. You stay with Winnie in Toronto, then join me on tour all the way to Vancouver. Hey, Attila's brought his mum with him. You play piano for me on my song, Tyler Smiles, at the Vancouver Folk Festival to a standing ovation. And enjoyed it so much that two years later, you toured New Zealand with me. Saw your brother Mick again, and then to Australia. It's true, Attila's brought his mum with him. <laughs> they thought it would be fun for you to interview me on national TV. You were brilliant. You say, I feel as though I'm moving slowly down a road which is gently subsiding. Mid-90s, your swan song with the Brighton Festival Chorus, Elgar's Dream of Garontius at the Royal Festival Hall, Mum's Last Gig, your favourite piece of music ever. I was there. Then, in 1998, your final tour with me, my favourite memory of all, Germany. I've never been to Germany, John. I want to go there before I die. I want to talk to the people there. All this prejudice in my generation is just silly. But Mum, I said, you won't be like those other tours. 
I've told you about Germany. I play anti-fascist squats at autonomous centres. We sleep on the floor half the time. Sometimes it's really cold and very smoky. There is loads of very loud punk rock and everyone drinks the most incredible amount of beer, including me, especially me. I'm not sure it's the right tour for a lady of 75. But you were having none of it, so off we went. You, me, adverts, punk legend, TV Smith, and Danny the driver in my old Citroen, charging up and down the motorway. I told the organisers, and they were brilliant. They made such a fuss of you. Clean, comfortable, and warm everywhere. No smoke, and punk rock turned down where necessary. Most solicitors of all, my old mate, Mad Butcher Mike. A big, hard, red skinhead, founder of a legendary hardcore anti-fascist record label, loathed by every right-wing scumbag in Germany. He took a real shine to him, and he to you. He's not a bad butcher at all, John. He's a very nice chap. <laughs> Germany was your last foray. You sailed into your 80s, happy in Southwick. I moved nearby years before, then married Rabina. She spotted the signs before I did. I guess I simply couldn't believe that it would happen to you. But then came that fateful day in May 2004, when you set out in the car to visit Daphne, your sister-in-law, and forgot where you were going or why you were going there. It's been more than five years now, and here we are. The psychiatrist says you're doing very well, that the tablets are working, that we're doing all the right things, that the hours we spend are precious hours. We know that, I know that. I see it in your face every time I enter the room. Your indomitable spirit, your need for human warmth, for company, for stimulation, for mental challenge, is as strong as ever. Anyway, for me, no contest. You need me, you made me, I'll be there, that's it. But it's hard, Mum. For us, and above all, for you. Which is why I wrote this poem. To help you remember the poem of your life. The poem of our life.